think. So please welcome Nick. Okay, hello. Is this thing on? It is. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Nick. I work, yes, at Cloudflare, everybody's favorite CDN. And uh, I work on applied cryptography. And I'm going to talk today about the most interesting protocol in the world, uh, transport layer security. So um, if an anybody has used this browser, do you recognize this little icon right here? This is, uh, this is Netscape 1.1. This is the first web browser that had SSL, that had some sort of layer of security built into it. And it had this little icon here that looked like a gun and maybe a pin from a grenade. Uh, <laughs> but if they're connected, then that means your site's secure. They eventually improved it to uh, this little lock icon that evolved to this nice green lock in the address bar that we all know and love. Um, but HTTPS, SSL, this, this whole encryption thing on the web enabled a revolution, uh, starting with e-commerce. Uh, you could go to this beautiful website here with your, <laughs> with your browser and then buy some books or buy somebody's used stuff. Um, it, it actually was a, a, a revolution. And uh, to, to put into context, th this is this drawing that we did once of, of what the internet looks like. And uh, there's all these different links that connect over all these different protocols. But to access websites, it's really point to point. And you go from either your phone to a data center or your laptop computer to a data center. And uh, it, it's you know, a way to get information and websites. And uh, this originally HTTP is a plain text protocol. Everything is sent without any encryption or encoding. It's just letters on the wire. And um, <clears throat> after this came out, people wanted to add some security. So, uh, this protocol was invented called HTTPS. And the S is supposed to stand for secure, but uh, lately it's been sort of another S word. Uh, <laughs> so HTTP, HTTPS, H this is HTTP plus security. And uh, right now, th what that means almost exclusively is this protocol called transport layer security that you've all heard about. And it, pr it provides uh, data encryption and integrity as well as authentication of the server. It tells you what website you're actually going to and gives you a way to verify that that's who it really is. Um, so th this, is, this, is a, this is a messy details talk. So uh, as with anything, the devil is in the details. So let's go a little bit back to the beginning. Um, SSL was secure sockets layer, was the original protocol that Netscape invented uh, back in the early 90s to encrypt the web. And uh, it was invented by this guy, Kip E.B. Hickman. And uh, I, you know, I heard some stories about this. I saw that M Moxie Marlin Spike uh, in DEF CON 18 sort of tracked him down and had a phone call with him. Um, but there was this story about SSL v1 being presented. And I emailed um, Philip Hallam Baker. And he kind of described the setting in which SSL1 was presented. And uh, it was by Mark Andreessen at, at MIT to a group of around six people. And um, the people in the audience apparently broke it right away because there was no authenticity checks at all. So SSL v1 was an auspicious start to a security protocol. It's com you know, completely unauthenticated. Um, so to, to, to get back to it, it, it was evolved and I'll, I'll get into how SSL became TLS and you know, became something that we use every day. But uh, it really breaks down into two different pieces. One is public key cryptography, and this is how you as a browser and a server sort of establish shared keys and uh, the identity of the server and data encapsulation, which is you want to send data to the server and back. You have to encrypt it somehow and authenticate it. Uh, this key establishment part happens with this, with uh, what's called SSL handshake. And um, this is, you know, pretty complicated. There's pieces going back and forth. Um, but let's focus first on that little check mark on the left, uh, which is certificate validation. Um, and this is how TLS provides authenticity. Um, this beautiful thing that we've all built together called the public key infrastructure. And uh, so just bear with me for a second. Like, how, how does this work? Uh, this is, it's based on something called X509 certificates. And certificates are files with 
different things like I the identity of who you are, a public key, and they're usually digitally signed by a certificate authority. And uh, this certificate authority has a certificate itself, and then uh, oftentimes that's signed by another certificate authority. This forms a chain of trust. And as long as you can trust the sort of dark brown certificate there, uh, then you can, and these signatures are correct, then you can say, okay, yes, this is someone I trust to issue certificates for websites, and therefore this site is really who it is. Um, so this, this whole chain of trust thing seems really easy, right? It's just ch checking digital signatures, checking, making sure that the, the metadata inside it is correct and matches the site you're going to. Well, um, yeah, boy, was that, <laughs> boy, boy, were we wrong about that being easy. So I'm going to explore a couple different ways in which uh, this was completely messed up, uh, including implementation bugs, intentional flaws, and uh, issues of trust. So. To, to make it more clear, this is what we mean when we validate a certificate. This is in that check mark in that first diagram. Is uh, as a client, you parse the certificate, you find a parent certificate, and you make sure that the signature on this leaf certificate is signed by the parent's public key. And if that parent is trusted by you, then you're good, and you know this this is good, and you you, you go on. If not, you do the same thing on the parent certificate. You check its certificate, uh, check its signature. And um, so this is just making sure the certificate's correct. What about actually tying this to your encryption channel? There's really two ways of doing this in TLS. Uh, first is the RSA method. And um, in this method, as a client, you encrypt a pre-master secret, a bit of, of data that you want to share with the server with the server's public key and send it over. If the server can derive the same keys from that information as you, then that's sort of an impl implicit validation that they have the corresponding private key. Um, Diffie-Hellman, this is much more recommended, by the way. Um, what happens is, <laughs> yeah. You, uh, you sign a couple things, right? At, at the server signs several parameters that are used to derive these shared keys, and uh, you just verify it with the certificate. Now, so there's two, two things, right? Validate certificate, tie certificate to channel. Um, if phase one breaks, then all you have to do is use some untrusted certificate, and the client will say, okay, this is good. I believe that this is a real trusted certificate. Go on from there. Um, the second phase, if there's a problem in that, then you can use a real certificate, but uh, a fake signature. Has anybody seen this code before? Um, we got one couple hands out here. Um, this, this is code in a library called GNU TLS. And what this is really doing is it's supposed to check if this is a CA. And it turns out, if you remember your C correctly, that um, anything other than a zero return value is true and a zero is false. Uh, what happens here is if that one call, check if CA, um, sorry, the um, get signed data fails, then you return result. And that result is going to be a negative number. <laughs> And therefore, it's going to say, yes, this is a CA. So this, this bug really says if you give it an invalid issuer, then, oh yeah, this is a CA. It's not bad. It's actually completely good as a CA. And uh, this code was introduced in 2005. Uh, <laughs> it was discovered, in, uh, again, as a bug in 2014. So um, in, in all tools that used Linux GNU TLS for nine years, uh, this channel binding, this is certificate authority code was, was in there. Um, this might be more familiar. Has anybody seen this code before? This is the title of the talk, right? Um, this is in Apple's common crypto library. And again, this is just a simple programming bug. Uh, accidentally, there's two go-to fails. I, I don't really know exactly how you could put two go-to fails, but um, from what I understand, uh, they're not using Git at Apple. Uh, for this library. So if, if anybody remembers how you merge, it, merge problems in subversion, sometimes you end up getting duplicate lines. Maybe that's how it happened. Uh, some people have considered that it may be more subversive, but I, I highly doubt it. But in any case, what this does is it'll always go to fail. And go to fail will mean this key exchange, yes, is correctly tied. So all you have to do in this case is just use a certificate that's valid and put in some garbage as a signature, and you're going to be good. 
So these are, these are easy, right? These are just simple programming bugs, and they completely invalidate the authentication in, in TLS. Let's look at something a little bit more complicated. Um, so there's several different ways in which you can do dig digital signatures. Uh, this is the most common for RSA. It's a standard called PKCS number one, 1 1.5. It's, um, it's pretty horrible. <laughs> but, um, it looks for a zero, one, a bunch of Fs, and a zero, and then it has this digest info, which tells you what type of, of hash it is, and this is a, an ASN1 object, and if anybody's worked with ASN1, it's, it's not super fun. Uh, and then the message di digest. Um, back in 2006, at the crypto conference, uh, Daniel Bleichenbacher, I, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, I am in Germany. Uh, <laughs> anyway, see, he found that, he sort of surmised that if you parse this incorrectly and were able to put some extra garbage at the end, uh, you can construct a fake signature or some signature that will actually work. And this only works if um, you're using RSA with a public exponent of three. And uh, I don't need to go too much into the details of RSA, but uh, if, you, if you do um, a signature verification, you want it to be fast in RSA, and that's really an exponentiation with the public exponent. So people use three because that's ex incredibly fast. All you have to do is take your message and cube it, and then you'll see if it, that, that's actually going to decrypt the message. And uh, it turns out that if you can arbitrarily choose garbage in there, you can construct some value that cubes into um, something that looks like this. And th then you can actually make a, a valid signature on, on some certificate, and, and it'll just work. And it turns out that there are several routes in um, the Certificate Authority trusted root stores in all sorts of browsers that have been around forever that use this public exponent of three. So this, is, this actually was practical, if you can put some garbage at the end of the digest. But uh, every implementation now checks that there's no garbage at the end. But um, there was recently another mistake, right? So um, this is another library. Uh, called NSS, which is very, very widely used. It was developed by uh, Mozilla to do all the crypto in Firefox, as well as it was used in Chrome um, back in the day. But um, turns out there was another coding error. And in this case, it's in this digest info. And as I mentioned, it's ASN1, which is uh, a it's an encoding format that is, is kind of crazy complicated, much more complicated than it has to be. And there are two encoding formats. Uh, BER, which is what this is named after, is the basic encoding rules. There are multiple ways of encoding data. And you can just put extra zeros. There's multiple, uh, the, the length of length values is arbitrary. So you can have different length length values. And that, that actually turned out to be the problem here is that there is an integer overflow in the ASN1 length. So you could actually put a bunch of garbage in your length and have a several multi-byte length value that it would just skip over the garbage. And um, as with the previous attack, you can construct a message that cubes into something like this by repeatedly just trying cube roots. And there's an algorithm to do that. Uh, my colleague Filippo on uh, put, it, put this up on GitHub. So you, if you want to exploit this, you can do so. And your, your signatures are going to look weird, right? This is not what a digital signature lo usually looks like. It usually has quite a bit of entropy. But um, this is a, a small number, and if you cube that, you get something that actually looks like, like this. And it'll, this was actually trusted by, by Firefox for a while. So there are subtle ways that you know, programming bugs can, can creep in and, and break the trust that you get from TLS. Um, but speaking of, of these issues of trust, speaking of, of the public key infra infrastructure, you don't necessarily have to find bugs and flaws to take advantage of it. Um, so here's a quiz for everybody. Uh, in your, say, browsers at home uh, or operating systems, whatever you use, if you're not sort of paranoid like me and have removed CAs, uh, how, how many countries have controls of CAs that um, things are trusted? Tr that, that, can actually sign any certificate that'll be trusted. Does anybody have a guess? Too many, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, the, that's right. It's actually 46. <laughs> so this is from uh, EFF's SSL observatory data. So 46 countries around the world could, you know, just arbitrarily create certificates for any website. And 
Um, that's, that's also kind of crazy. How, how do you really trust that this was issued correctly if there are uh, different entities that are supposed to follow rules but technically can create certificates for anything? Um, this came up earlier in this year and the year before, but it's been a sort of endemic problem with SSL. People want to look inside of encrypted data to look for bad stuff uh, or to, say, inject ads. And uh, Superfish is one of these things. It was installed on Lenovo laptops, and what it did was it installed its own trusted root into your root store. It made it so that every browser you have will trust this Lenovo root. So there's all sorts of different ways that these sort of things are installed. So they install roots, whether it's your corporate IT department, this happens all the time, especially here in Europe, uh, antivirus spot software or Superfish, which is by your OEM, or say the country of Kazakhstan just proposed this for the entire country. So they want to install a root so they can you know, be the person in the middle, decrypt all your traffic and look at it and go, go onwards. And the way that works is they, on the fly, forge a certificate that is trusted by your computer. So this, this, is, this is bad in itself, but it also turns out that some of these proxies themselves don't validate certificates correctly upstream. So if someone was to uh, manipulate this that's not your proxy, anybody can, can create sort of a fake certificate. And this is some, a lot of the research around Superfish found that this is the case. Oops. Uh, <laughs> um, not only are you having ads injected into your supposedly encrypted streams, uh, anybody on the outside can fake sites. Um, a, an extra bonus on this is if you install roots into your store, CAs that you trust, uh, they typically, browsers will bypass these advanced techniques called key pinning. So if you, say for example in Chrome, you, they have a, a pre-computed pre list of sites and what certificates they should have, if it turns out they see a certificate that's signed by one of these extra roots that was added by you know, any one of these things, then <laughs> key pinning doesn't work anymore. Oops, again. Uh, <laughs> so tr trust, trust is hard, and, and there's a lot of different ways in which, in which it's been broken from bad code to bad infrastructure to just bad political uh, organization of, of who should get access to, to making these keys. Um, let, let, looking a little more deeply, uh, there's a bunch of different libraries that do crypto. And as I mentioned here, almost all of these were affected by these validation bugs at one point or another in the last, in the last decade. So that's the client side. Let's talk about some issues on the server side. And just, just as a summary, most websites um, use Apache, Microsoft IISS, uh, Nginx, sorry, not ISS, IIS, and uh, Nginx, or say, Google's internal stuff. And, and this mostly uses OpenSSL. And you might have heard some things about OpenSSL lately, but I'll, I'll, I'll get into that. Um, earlier in the decade, or actually earlier in the last decade, there was another library that was very common, and it was by RSA, and it was called BeSafe. And BeSafe uh, was one of the first robust SSL implementations, and SSL implementations are all, all these crypto <clears throat> things that I've mentioned require you to generate random numbers to generate these keys. And um, I don't know if you've heard about this, you probably have, but <laughs> dual EC DRBG. It turns out there is a random number generator that was standardized by NIST from the NSA uh, that is almost guaranteed to be backdoored. So uh, even if all of your implementation is good, if your random numbers that are using in your system are bad, you can work backwards and decrypt a stream. So this was in BeSafe, and it came up even, re even in the last couple weeks, where in Juniper, <coughs> Juniper Screen OS, uh, they had this dual EC DRBG, although they changed the parameters to not the ones that the NSA knows, but to the ones that potentially they know. Uh, but yeah, randomness is also you know, another weakness to the system. Heartbleed. Uh, this was a big deal last year, sort of. But um, it, it turns out this is, this is just another dumb bug in C, right? It's, it's just an overread that ends up disclosing information on the server. Uh, this one was really bad because uh, there is another architecture problem in TLS servers, which is 
your private key is kept in the same memory space as everything else. And if you think of the way that people design security systems, defense in depth, this, this is kind of absurd that the most exposed system that you have, the web server, what's actually being connected to by the outside world, has in its memory space the keys to the kingdom, the private key. But Harpley just helped reveal this, and, and it was another big one that affected, as I said, almost everything uses OpenSSL, and it, it, it was in OpenSSL for several versions. So implementation bugs are fun, right? It's, it's, it's fine, people write code, people mess up writing code. There are formal verification methods, there are uh, ways to catch this. But um, this talk is, is about TLS, and uh, so TLS might be hard to implement correctly. A lot of people made mistakes. What about the protocol itself? Um, turns out this has been quite uh, a disastrous couple years in terms of the protocol. Um, let's, this is the timeline of, I guess, TLS and SSL versions. SSL 1, I guess it's 1994. There's not really a lot of record as to when that happened, but um, SSL 2 came out in 94. 99 was SSL v3. Uh, then the IETF got a, their hands on it and turned it into a new protocol called TLS 1, which on the underlying, if you look at the bits and bytes, it's actually SSL 3.1. It's not that much is different. There's uh, a stronger definition of padding, I'll get into that later, but there's not, not many things have changed. Uh, then down in 2006, we came up with TLS 1.1, which did almost, again, not very many changes. It just made sure that in CBC mode, there's an IV. I'll get to that too. Um, and then TLS 1.2, 1.3 is sort of coming up in the next, in the next year. Um, it's, it, it looks like, okay, nothing can really happen. It, these protocols all seem similar, uh, but in the meantime, people have developed HTTP and, and how the web is used for sending information has evolved. It, back in, say, 94, web pages were just one static thing. We didn't have cookies, we didn't have JavaScript, we didn't have all of these sort of fancy bells and whistles that are in the modern web. Uh, so, turns out that HTTP is really great for enabling crypto attacks. Uh, <laughs> if you can, Use, you, can, you can do repeated plain text attacks, you can do chosen plain text attacks. There's a lot of different things that HTTP allows you to do, as long as you can get man in the middle access. And as an attacker, this is, this is kind of how you do it. If you are on the local network with somebody else, then you can use ARP spoofing or some other method to get man in the middle position, and you can inject random JavaScript onto unencrypted pages. And with that JavaScript, uh, you can trigger the browser to send requests. Now, in HTTP, there are some nice things like cross-site origin policies that prevent, uh, prevent you from, from really doing a lot of different things, but you can, you can inject JavaScript into one page to make requests to another, and the way that cookies work is they'll always be sent. Um, even if the server has cross-site request forgery protection, uh, you can still send cookies, you can still send requests, and it turns out that if you can trigger errors in TLS, then the client will resend the same thing. So it'll send, you can send passwords, anything that goes along, you can kind of put whatever you want in the URL and stretch this out, do chosen plain text things. And what this allows is uh, different, what are called oracles, uh, which is, tools to, as an attacker, reveal the plain text one bit or byte at a time. And compression oracles are, I guess, the easiest to explain in this. Uh, HTTP, in order to save space, is compressed. And typically we use some algorithm like gzip or a dictionary-based hash, uh, <coughs> sorry, compression algorithm in which if you have two repeated strings, it's gonna be shorter than if you d do not have two repeated strings. And that ends up being enough to allow you to decrypt an entire session if you can get the client to repeat. So if you use something like this, you can get a client to keep sending requests. And you can, as a man in the middle position, you can kind of rearrange bytes and packets around, but you can get the browser to keep sending requests with secret data in it. You can't see inside the browser, but you can see the encrypted packets going past you. And um, crime and breach are, th these came out a couple years ago, as practical, very practical implementations of a 
Oracle for compression. And in a practical sense, this is, this is kind of how it works. You uh, choose your padding, and um, oops, padding here is uh, anything at the end of the query string. You control this. You control the JavaScript, so you can put whatever you want there. You can get some padding, and you want to guess the cookie. So the point is you keep repeating the guesses until uh, it matches the cookie. And if, you, if your guess matches the cookie exactly, then the message is going to be really small. Um, and if you look at this, say, say you're guessing one byte at a time. If you have a bad guess, it's probably going to be longer, and it's going to be five compressed blocks. And if you have the correct guess, it's going to be four compressed blo blocks. So if you uh, use your padding to kind of align yourself to hit the border between these encryption blocks, you can go one by one decrypting your values in this cookie and go all the way down to the, to the bottom. And, and this is a practical attack that's been <clears throat> that's been pulled off. So um, crime is about TLS compression. Everyone disabled TLS compression after crime happened. Uh, Breach came out the next year at Black Hat, and this relies on HTTP compression, which for performance reasons, nobody has turned off. So crime is not really a problem now, but Breach is actually very exploitable in many, many, many websites, um, which is lamentable. But compression is not the only way to have, have an oracle. Uh, padding oracles are a kind of an older idea. Uh, they were originally described by Vaudenay in 2002, and they rely on two really, really bad choices that people made in deciding how to encrypt things in TLS. And these are CBC mode, and then the Mac then encrypt construction. So, if you recall, I don't, block ciphers require you to have a certain number of blocks of data that go in, and, certain, and that same number comes out. So for AES, the most popular block cipher, we have 16 bytes come in, 16 bytes come out. So um, you, I'm sure you've all seen the ECB penguin. It's, uh, it, it's the, the classic example of why CBC matters, or why you need to do chaining. If you, if you only encrypt blocks on their own and don't chain them together, then you can actually see some, see, if you have low entropy data, if you have data that, does, that repeats the same kind of 16-byte blocks over and over again, like images, then you can kind of make out what the image is. Um, with CBC, this is a way just of mixing one block into the next block. And it, you just XOR in the ciphertext into the next plain text block and encrypt. And this gives you uh, a good amount of randomness all throughout your data. And decryption happens sort of the same way. You start with this initialization vector, and then you just XOR the cipher text block into your decrypted block, and you go all the way down. Um, so this is, this is CBC mode. It, it, looks, it looks fine, right? I mean, this is, this is something that is a good way to kind of combine crypto, or so we thought in the 90s when this was invented. Um, Another debate that happened was, if you want to have, you need integrity and encryption. So which do you do first? Do you encrypt first, and then you add an integrity tag, or do you do integrity first, and then add encryption? Um, somewhat disastrously, they decided to do the integrity first, and then encryption. And for TLS, it, it kind of looks like this. There's uh, a data, HMAC, and then padding. And the data itself, it, and then that whole thing is padded up to a 16-byte boundary for AES or an 8-byte boundary for triple DES, but um, up to the 16-byte boundary and then, yeah, encrypted. So this HMAC is, you, you have, ha, um, <clears throat> excuse me, MAC the data with the header and the sequence number, and that's, uh, and that that's, gives you data that's authenticated and then encrypted. But um, that padding there is not authenticated, which turns out to be a critical flaw. Uh, now, in TLS or in SSL, what does that padding look like? Well, um, the terminal byte is the number of bytes of padding remaining, and then it just has a bunch of garbage. So you can pad things with uh, zero, and then it has zero bytes before it, or one with one byte before it, two, whatever, whatever. Um, and then in TLS, they updated that so that these bytes of padding have to match the original padding. But uh, just having unauthenticated data is enough to give you what's called a padding oracle. So if an attacker is able to distinguish between guessing a padding correctly or incorrectly, that's enough to decrypt an entire message. And technically how that works is 
if you are in a man in the middle position, uh, you want to guess the last byte of data, uh, you modify the previous ciphertext block and you put in a guess. And uh, the way CBC mode works is that gets XORed in with the, your decrypted block and you end up with uh, M, which is the padding. So um, if you know that the padding's wrong versus right, uh, in the bottom case here, you know that the padding is correct because 0x00 zero 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 is, is a correct padding. Um, the HMAC is going to be wrong because this is you're XORing some bad decrypted data into there. But um, you can work back, backwards with this XOR logic to figure out what that value A is. And then once you have A, you can work back and figure out what the next value before it B is. And all you need to do is to be able to tell as an attacker, whether you're in case one or case two. Um, this padding oracle was originally built into the protocol. So there was, uh, this is the original Vaudenay attack in 2002. You'd have a different error code for whether the padding was wrong or the HMAC was wrong. And as an attacker, you try all 256 values for X and once you guess correctly, it's going to give you the error code that says, oh, bad HMAC, meaning you got past the padding and, you're, you're, and then you're right and you actually have decrypted one byte. So this, error, this problem keeps coming back. There are many, many ways in which you can have side channels. Um, so the, the error code side channel works is if you have an incorrect guess, bad padding, correct guess, bad, bad HMAC. Um, Later, uh, the next year, Bonet and Brumley came up with uh, this timing side channel. So it, it turns out that if you are, have an incorrect guess, then th this is going to be fast because you're not doing the HMAC. And it's going to be slow if you uh, actually do get the padding correctly. So you just look at how long it takes for the server to do this, this computation. And voila, you have another padding oracle. You just might have to try it a couple extra times to get rid of timing jitters. But this lets you decrypt entire messages. And in a the context of HTTP, this is your entire cookie or your password or something like this. Now, this is all well and good, but as I mentioned, things keep coming back. And Patterson came out with Lucky 13. Uh, this is two years ago. And it relies on a really kind of obscure fact about how this HMAC is actually computed. Uh, so as I mentioned before, you can HMAC uh, it, this, this sort of 8-byte sequence number, 5-byte header, and your data. And the, the fix for this timing attack that happened was you just always HMAC the whole thing. If the padding's wrong, you HMAC the whole message. And it turns out that in most implementations of HMAC, uh, there's a lucky byte. There's, there's a point in which the HMAC takes more time than it would before. There are different compression functions inside of it. And if you're at 55 bytes, it's going to be faster than if you're at 56 or 57. So if you have, this is an entire 64-byte message, uh, which is just aligned on a four AES blocks. And so what you can do is try to guess the padding. And if you guess the padding wrong, it's going to be a slow hash. And if you guess the first byte of padding right, it's going to be also slow. But if you get really lucky and guess the last two bytes of padding correctly, it's going to be fast. And voila, you're two steps into your Oracle attack. And you can take this all the way down. So this, this is found again uh, this year, a couple months ago, in Amazon's new implementation uh, S2N. They created a TLS impl implementation from scratch. What could go wrong? And uh, <laughs> they tried to protect themselves from Lucky 13 and ended up having the same sort of thing. So uh, if you look at it, there's, this is a, a graph that a colleague of mine, Filippo, put together in trying to fix this in Go's crypto library, which um, sort of... <laughs> Presciently, Adam Langley, who wrote it, had a comment saying, there's probably a timing side channel in this HMAC. Uh, <laughs> and it turned out that, yeah, yes, there was. And uh, that was Lucky 13. So <laughs> another really, really subtle thing that you would not have predicted in the 90s that came back to bite us. And uh, a really bad thing about this is that for TLS 1.0 and 1.2, that was the only way to use block ciphers, is in CBC mode. So 
unless you have both servers TLS 1.2, you're kind of screwed. Um, and that leads us to another idea, which is the downgrade attack. And the general philosophy around this is that if you support something old, someone's going to trick you into using it. And you know, there's ways to defend against that, but it's, it's really difficult to get right. Uh, as a bit of a background, the, these are cipher suites, right? This is what SSL needs all these different things, to, this sort of alphabet soup, to decide on what crypto algorithms to use. And to break it down, it's um, you have a key exchange, certificate key, transport cipher, and then an, an integrity function. And the server gets a list from the client, and it sort of picks its favorite from the list, and then you know chooses it. Uh, and if anybody was over at the next hall for the previous talk, you'll know that there's something called export ciphers. And these were supported for a very long time. And this is to comply with this antiquated 90s crypto export law in the United States. And these are really, really weak ciphers. So um, these were supported by clients and servers all the way up until this year. They still are. And the fact that the server will always pick the best one of the client, everyone's safe, right? The server will always pick the best one. Turns out, no. Uh, <laughs> these are several attacks that uh, were described in the previous talk in which you can end up forcing clients and servers to use these really bad, crappy crypto. And the, the reason is it boils down to the only thing that's in this handshake that's authenticated uh, is this key derivation stuff. So the pieces that you use to derive the share, shared keys. And so this is what Freak is. Uh, if you sit in the middle, the client is going to say, hey, these are the ciphers I support. You just change that list into, OK, I only support export ciphers. And then the server say, OK, well, I support an export cipher too. I guess we're going to use this. You must be an old client. And uh, then all you have to do is crack that export key, which is you know, 40 bits of encryption, and, and you're good. Go from there. Or in some cases, you have to crack a 512-bit RSA key, which is also it's, it's computationally doable. The way that logjam works is very similar. Uh, this works with RSA cipher suites. This works with Diffie-Hellman cipher suites. And this relies on the fact that uh, you can force the client and the server to agree to use these Diffie-Hellman parameters to, uh, to do key exchanges that are weak, just old crypto, small key sizes. And you, you crack it. And then as a man in the middle, you can manipulate and read everything. Um, Weak DH is sort of the same thing. It relies on the fact that some servers use uh, Diffie-Hellman parameters that were pre-computed. And you can go kind of three quarters of the way through the attack because they're all using the same Apache shared prime for this Diffie-Hellman stuff. So this relies on unauthenticated protocol in the handshake. More on this to come. Um, in the, in the, the, the theme of downgrade attacks, Poodle. This turned out to be the nail in the coffin for SSL v3. Um, <laughs> you can do this thing called the downgrade dance. You can f force browsers to, to negotiate down from SSL from TLS 1.2 to 1.1 to SSL to 1.0 to SSL 3. And uh, as I mentioned before, the padding in SSL 3 is just a bunch of X's and then a number. So you can fill it in with anything. So if you align your blocks, so that the last block only has one relevant bit of data, you can do a padding attack. And this, when people came up with this, they were just like, obvious. Obviously, we can do this. This is terrible. And SSL v3 is completely broken. Um, TLS Poodle, it turns out that uh, th I mentioned there's one change between SSL and, and TLS 1. One, one. one of the major changes is that that padding had to be defined as repeat the same padding value. Well, some servers didn't do that. So uh, <laughs> yeah, you can end up doing the same attack. And several, uh, a large percentage of websites are still susceptible to TLS Poodle. Uh, another threat to TLS, aging crypto. Uh, <laughs> that's, yeah, I mean, Diffie, he's, he's still doing well. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> this is sort of in the news now with, with uh, different signature algorithms based on hash functions. Uh, this was presented back here at CCC in 2000, 2008. Some researchers were able to uh, forge one certificate 
from another by finding a collision in this hash function that you use in the signature. But uh, this is kind of the details of it. It's a little complicated. But they were able to make themselves a trusted certificate authority and issue certificates for everything. And from that point onwards, MD3, MD5, this is an old hash function, had to be kind of booted from everything. So how do, how do all these attacks fit on the timeline? This is our TLS timeline, as I mentioned. Um, these are the major attacks that I, that I mentioned. And they were really concentrated past TLS 1.2. And uh, this beast, I didn't go into this, but um, this is the first one of the backronyms. So <laughs> attacks that you, I, I forget exactly, browser, something, 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 yeah. The, you, you take a nice word and you make an attack name out of it. But uh, uh, down around Heartbleed, this is when the logo trend happened. So every vulnerability had to have a logo. And uh, there's a really high concentration of these things around the last three or four years. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, if you can look here, TLS 1.2, that was 2008. 2012, nobody was using it. Uh, this is from SSL Pulse. Even 2014, SSL v3 was supported almost universally. Now we're in a slightly better position, but it takes a really long time for servers to upgrade. And same thing for clients. Right now, we're seeing something around 75% of connections are TLS 1.2, which is great. Um, but the, you can clap for that if you want, but uh, TLS 1.2 solves most of, most of these problems. But um, most of these browsers, they came out in 2003, 2004. That it's, it was at least five years later. So um, it takes a while for things to get up to date. Now, this, is, this kind of paints a grim picture for these old vulnerabilities. But at, at least from the ones that we've seen, we can learn a, a few lessons, uh, and, and one is that if an attacker can identify one bit of information about the plain text, then it's basically over. Um, the way that HTTPS works, repeated data can be sent, and you can take that one bit and expand it to an entire message. Um, there are side channels everywhere, timing side channels, computing side channels. There's been research about uh, working on in, the, in cloud computing, if you are able to do cache timing. So if you're running one process and there's crypto hopping on another process, you can find out how long things are taking. This is incredibly dangerous. Um, almost all the things I mentioned having to do with uh, oracles relied on unauthenticated data. And having unauthenticated data, doing Mac first and then encrypt, leaving even padding. Padding is incredibly important. And, and checking it correctly is, is incredibly hard, it turns out. We've messed it up so many times. But um, AEADs, this is authenticated encryption with additional data. This is a construction that was introduced in TLS 1.2. Uh, AES-GCM is sort of the most popular version of that. Uh, we should definitely use those and just drop CBC altogether. CBC is just a really, really difficult crappy construction um, that hasn't serviced. It's served, served us well to now, but it's, there's, there's many ways to attack it, and there will be many ways to attack it in the future. Um, X509, the structure for certificates, which is ASN1, the, these are really incredibly hard to implement correctly. There's, they're at least nine years older than SSL itself, uh, these protocols, and they're going to cause you problems using this. And um, <coughs> as for downgrade attacks, you know, support insecure crypto or protocols uh, at your own risk uh, because people will be able to somehow downgrade you to using them. So I skipped a lot of issues here. Uh, TLS has had tons, tons more issues. I mean, Beast, this is the RSA decryption oracle. S Channel had a remote code execution bug a few uh, months ago. Triple handshake had to do, I didn't even mention client authentication and how broken that is. Um, the whole CA e ecosystem and certificate authorities messing up when it comes to issuing certificates didn't even go into that. Uh, RC4 weaknesses. Yeah, apparently this, this stream cipher, um, Patterson it, around the same time as Lucky13 found you can decrypt an entire RSA, uh, an entire TLS stream if you use RC4. Um, there are vulnerabilities in big num libraries. There's issues with forward secrecy. Uh, TLS is just absolutely loaded with problems from everything from the implementation side to the protocol itself. So uh, just enough complexity to hang yourself with. Now, th I would say this is the end of the talk, but uh, there's just one more thing. Uh, I'd like to 
J just as a thought experiment, go into some other attacks that follow up what we saw in the last room. Um, so there's other negotiations that happen within TLS. Uh, as, as we talked about with Freak and with Logjam, it's, hey, which Diffie-Hellman group do we choose? Or which Cypher do we choose? Uh, there's also some other negotiations that happen. So there's NPN and ALPN. These are protocols that allow you to upgrade to HTTP2. And then there's which, which elliptic curves do I support? This is really interesting, actually. Um, TLS supports a ton of kind of crazy elliptic curves. And uh, what if you did a downgrade attack on that? So this is a new kind of TLS vulnerability introducing called curve swap. So this follows the exact same model as Freak and Logjam. And what you do in a man in the middle position is you take the supported ciphers and you swap it with uh, the smallest, weakest possible curves supported by both parties. And you, put, you make sure that it's a, a curve, that, <clears throat> sorry, ellip elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman for key exchange. So that both parties are going to be using these kind of smaller curves to derive their keys. Um, step two is, this one's, <laughs> bear with me, really, we don't know how to do this one yet, but solve discrete log problem. <clears throat> <laughs> so, okay, yeah, yes, that's uh, something that's not really doable right now, but um, on small curves it might be. So b before we go into that, let's just think about what curves are supported in TLS. There's, there's some curves here called s the sec t curves, and this is a uh, 163-bit curve over, a, it's a binary curve. This is, this, is, uh, this is not the type of curve that we typically use, but when elliptic curves were originally standardized for TLS, it was all the rage. We had prime curves, we had binary curves. They were both kind of equivalent. And it, if you look at the data, and I, I did a survey of a lot of client hellos, 4.3% uh, of clients support this uh, kind of weak curve. And this is, this is about as strong as, I think, equivalent to RSA 1024. So even though when you're doing a negotiation, you expect to be using a really strong elliptic curve, like a 256-bit one for their key exchange, uh, the man in the middle can downgrade you to um, this nice smaller curve. And if, as an attacker, you can break the discrete logarithm problem on this curve, then for the Alexa Top 100, 1.13% 1 of sites, yeah, you can, you can make them both use this really kind of crappy curve for key establishment. But as I sort of, as you guys have alluded to in your chuckling, uh, uh, nobody's really broken DLP for any curves around this size. They're the sort of largest curve that's been broken is 110 bits or so. But um, there's a reason we don't use binary curves anymore. They've kind of gone out of style. Um, there are index calculus techniques that are supposedly better than brute, sport, brute force on, these, on binary curves, so people consider them weak. And we're not sure what kind of research has been done in private about, uh, say, binary curves. So just the good news about this is that in TLS 1.3, the new standard, all these curves have been excised. So, and there's a lot of these bugs have been kind of removed from the protocol itself. But uh, it's been a long and rocky road for transport layer security. And that's the end. And before we start the Q&A, just a quick announcement. If you're here for Methodisch Incorrect, it switched to Sal G. So you should go there if you want to see it live. There's going to be a stream in this room. But if you want to be there in person, you should go there. I will give you, let's say, 30 seconds to leave. And then please be quiet, because we want to do Q&A properly. Um, you can use this time to think of questions. We have lots of mics, two, two there, one there, one on top, and on the other side, too. And also, if you're on the ISC or on Twitter, ask questions. We have a signal angel that will read out your questions for us. Okay, let's start at number one, please. Hi. Uh, could you say something about uh, Cloudflare's strategy to not 
Face Out schauen. As Google and the others. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, <laughs> so, as with any one of these protocols or types of crypto that are broken or old, once they're definitively broken or old, they should be completely excised. So, there's been a plan to sunset SHA-1, uh, let's say, by the end of 2000, by the beginning of 2017, so the end of next year. And uh, the timing on which this, this is to happen is, um, is, is sort of debatable. And <clears throat> there's, there's really a question about whether or not SHA-1 is something that is a, a credible threat to happen within the next year or not, or whether it's a credible happen, threat to happen within the next five years in terms of forging a certificate. So um, whether or not you should continue to issue SHA-1 certificates or not, it, it's, it's, it's really something that, it, it's, a, it's a big debate that's going on right now. Hello. Uh, but if you compare to MD5, uh, so now we have uh, free start collisions. Right. So, and it, it took two years. Uh, so, yeah. so, it, so one thing to keep in mind in this case, and, and I can go back to the slide about the MD5 collision, is that having a collision in SHA-1 is not enough to forge a certificate. Uh, what you have to do is actually get the CA itself uh, to, to predict a certificate that's created by the CA that aligns perfectly with the certificate that you want to forge. And there are some techniques like putting randomness, entropy into the serial number that can help defend against that. But um, yes, there's a free start collision. I don't know, it could, be, it could be within the next month that we see a real SHA-1 collision. But um, in terms of colliding certificates, that's somewhat of a different story. Internet, please. Thank you. Do you think we would be in a better shape today if SHTTP had won the race over um, HTTPS? And why have we not moved to something like uh, SPKI, SDSI, or any other alternative to PKI? Well, uh, as speaking as, as part of, of Cloudflare, we control one side of the equation. And as with any security, pro security protocol, you need both the client and the server to agree on what they're going to use. So the evolution of the entire marketplace determines uh, which algorithms or which protocols you're going to use. And HTTPS ended up winning over the long term because it was most widely supported. And uh, as with any of these things, it's kind of a winner take all. Um, Number three, please. Uh, yes, hi. Um, we clearly suck at implementing protocols, right? So we need to be able to upgrade stuff relatively, relatively rapidly, because we will break it again and again and again. We'll need to upgrade. Uh, upgrading browsers is hard. Like, I actually have to take an LVM snapshot before I upgrade my browser, because I really don't know what's going to break. Uh, why? isn't any of the browsers going the route of uh, GNU-PG, where basically there is a completely separate piece of software running in a separate process, communicating over standard in, standard out, and it's upgradable without touching any of the other system. Thank you. So the, the question is extracting TLS from the browser itself and putting it somewhere else. So one of the, the interesting things that <clears throat> has happened in the TLS, the HTTPS ecosystem, is that many of the browsers are actually doing that for the certificate validation. They're outsourcing that to the operating system itself. Firefox is one of the lone exceptions that has their entire uh, PKI stack. Um, I, I think it's, it's historical reasons, really. I mean, um, Chrome and Firefox auto-update, and they do so because they want to make sure that you have the latest and greatest things. Not, um, they have kind of taken the approach that uh, if your browser upgrades and it breaks, uh, too bad for you. It's we know better, and and that's that's sort of that's their strategy. So um, I, I, I'm not a browser vendor. Uh, I don't work for one of those companies, so I can't really uh, speak to what they want to do. Number two. Thank you. 
Um, you mentioned the defense in depth approach of separating the private key from the web server. Now, I know that Cloudflare offers keyless as a cell, mm -hmm. which I really like. Um, do you think that instead of just being a business advantage to you, this could be a realistic um, security measure for many websites that they separate their private key to something behind a, d d a separate layer of keyless SSL? Uh, yeah, I think this is, this is something that could be more generally applicable. Um, and this is something that in the la last IETF meeting they brought up. So there's a proposal for separating private key operations from the TLS itself. Uh, it was brought up as a RFC at the last ITF, so I would encourage you to check that out. Signal Angel, please. Frankie too wants to know whether IP version 6 encryption could replace TLS or mitigate at least some of these issues. So, IPv6 encryption, yeah, I, I think I don't see that as a replacement for TLS. Uh, I see uh, different layers of encryption, whether it's TCP crypt or uh, anywhere lower down on the <clears throat> on the stack, uh, as additional layers of defense in depth. So um, the good thing about TLS is is that it, it encapsulates your HTTP messages, and it's it's really just point to point on that on that side. So um, it, it allows you to really trust the server itself, whereas so something like encryption at lower levels. Yes, this is great. I mean, we have encryption on many different protocols. Uh, wireless, you know, uh, Wi-Fi is encrypted. All of your sort of 3G, 4G signals are encrypted. Um, more encryption is better. And I don't think that having one encryption on a lower layer should stop you from adding encryption on a higher layer. Microphone number four, please. Hello. So you have shown how slowly um, the TLS standard itself is evolving and uh, even much slower the adoption is evolving. And there would be my question, do you agree that we should uh, heavily invest, maybe even in the standard, to make it easier adoptable and do something more there? And have you concrete plans or proposals how this could be achieved? I don't have any concrete plans or proposals <laughs> on that, but I, I think it's a good idea. I mean, I think um, upgradability is one of the, the one of the most difficult problems we're facing in terms of these protocols, because as you saw in all these different versions, there were problems and they had to be fixed in different ways. Yeah. And we're in, say, the Internet of Things, the buzzword that we're all talking about. These are embedded devices that are going to have one copy of a protocol, and um, it, it's really hard to get uh, firmware to be able to you know, have a clean upgrade cycle. So it, I, I don't have any solution there, but I see that as one of the biggest problems going forward in using protocols that are potentially insecure. OK, thank you. Number six, please. Hey, uh, thanks for this nice set of reminders. Uh, one thing I'm wondering, when will you have any idea when TLS 1.3 would be like, finalized and when I can finally actually enable it on my web server? Uh, not yet. I, I don't have a concrete date on that, but um, it, it should happen within the next year. Hopefully. Thanks. Internet, please. Why is Cloudflare using elliptic curve DSA, even though it is also relying on a very high quality entropy um, of a pseudo RNG? So that, that's a good question. Um, a, as I mentioned, random number generation is very important for having secure cryptography. And ECDSA, or any sort of DSA-based algorithm, requires entropy for every signature, or at least it did originally. Um, there have been more recent RFCs on how to use ECDSA in a deterministic sense, where you don't need a lot of entropy, and Cloudflare has implemented that for our ECDSA. So our ECDSA is not using pure random numbers. It's uh, using a deterministic algorithm. So if we have a RNG co collision, it's not a big deal for us. Number one, please. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so after a talk of, with like a string of calamities uh, and depressing stuff, you know, I wonder if there are things that make you happy or optimistic about the future of TLS. It, it seems like you know we uh, a lot of those attacks were just after Snowden, so people were finally starting to pay attention. Um, you have things like the CA browser baseline requirements that were only finalized in 2012. Yep. Have, like once XP and Android 2 are dead, we'll have a shorter long tail. Like, 
Are there things that you're looking forward to or that are awesome about TLS? Yeah, I, I think some, some of the things that interest me and I, I'm excited by are, say, the, the My TLS project, which is formal, formally verified um, TLS. That, um, um, one that I sort of glossed over was the triple handshake, handshake vulnerability, and that was discovered by formal analysis of it. Uh, I think the work that's happening in TLS 1.3 to just eliminate, say, bad curves or the RSA handshake altogether are you know, promising steps, but uh, I think they could go a lot farther in terms of removing things having to do with X509 and ASN1 and all these very old legacy technologies that we're carrying along with us. Microsoft. Sorry if that wasn't too optimistic. <laughs> Number two, please. Hey, yeah, uh, what's your opinion, uh, just out of curiosity, what's your opinion on uh, Let's Encrypt? I think Let's Encrypt is great, and uh, as much, as, much as, as I sort of railed on TLS in this, in this conversation, um, having an encryption of any sort is preferred to not having encryption at all. And the greater percentage of, yeah, uh, thank you. <laughs> no, I think the, the greater percentage of the web that's encrypted, the better. And uh, me personally, I, I would be absolutely over, over, overjoyed if we could get every site to be HTTPS only. And that's, uh, and Let's Encrypt is a big part of that. For, for websites that can't use, say, Cloudflare, we offer SSL for free. Um, not everybody can use our services. Uh, this is a great option for getting a free certificate. Mm -hmm. Could we please get two more questions? So there's no point in standing up now. We just will finish what we started. Internet, please. Suppose we have a customer that insists on still using SSL version 3, and we badly need this customer. How to convince them to upgrade? How to convince them to upgrade? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> uh, so there are people who have legacy systems, right? SSL v3, as we saw, it was 100% adoption adoption on servers up until Poodle came out. So um, there are tons of different client libraries that only use SSL v3. Uh, one, one example is uh, Pingdom, which is a, a popular tool to uh, check if your website's online, uh, was using SSL v3. Uh, it actually upgrades at TLS once if the first connection fails, which we found out once we disabled SSL 3. But um, I, I would... <sighs> I mean, it's a, it's a hard sell, right? I mean, if you have a customer who wants to use a legacy protocol and it's only in use for specific clients that can't be upgraded, then it, it's better than having no encryption. So I don't really have a, have a strong argument. Microphone number two, please. Please make it short if you can. Sure. Uh, Cloudflare still seems to make life harder for Tor users. When will this stop? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some people in the front row that I think you should talk to. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're working on it. Okay, thanks. Okay, please, once again, thank Nick.